and I ended up writing this 12 page thing and there was something in it that they saw and they came back and went right here's the deal we're going to fund it we're going to fund the writing of it the developing of it but the deal was you're going to write it it was ultimately really kind of a love letter and a, a thank you note to those men some people would look at those gyms as scary places you know and maybe frightening places for me it was kind of my church today we are back with one of our seeing stars episodes and we are joined by someone who has many strings to his bow he is a screenwriter a producer an actor me and a director and not just of the features there <laughs> Uh, and he's also, well, you wasn't, a former junior ABA champion. Of course, it's Johnny yeah. Harris. Yeah. He's here. Johnny, thanks for coming on the show, pal. I can go now. So yeah. nice G up we, could, me there, yeah. uh, we could have done a re- we could have done a Wednesday episode about this, Johnny. I reckon. What do you think, George? Absolutely. We could have done a full blown boxing one. But as you're famous off the telly, it's a seeing stars episode instead. Uh. <laughs> uh, where should we start, George? Should we go straight in with the? Should go right to the back, right to the very start. So in these episodes, Johnny, we like to think, okay, you're famous for what you do, but your background is in boxing. So we want to feel like, first of all, we ask, what out of 10, where do you think you are on a boxing scan, a boxing fan scale? One being, don't know anything about it, 10 being diehard boxing fan. Um, where do you land? I'll, I'll probably, um, with regards to sort of facts and figures and, you know, current fighters and records and things like that, probably like a, a, a six or a seven. Nice. But the kind of the love for the sport, if you like. Um, like, you know, I, for the right fight, I'll, I'll sit up till five in the morning, you yeah. know, and I'll pay the extra for a good fight sort of thing. Mm. Um, I, I, I love, I, you know, I can be a bit of a snob with it as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, like, I'm, you know, I, if, if it's a really great fight with two fighters and stuff, I love it more than most. Mm. You know, I, I really get into it and I get into it and I love it. And I've got a lot of, really dear friends still so so my story is i, I boxed um up until the age of 18 and um you know so i so i gave up young but um but up until then it was kind of it was my life you know it was uh, i won um over the road the york called bethnal green i won the junior abas in 1989 and i boxed for the fitzroy lodge in lambeth and um and uh yeah so you know there's still all my friends mark Rygate who runs the club now steve bunce he was he was from my club um, Steve's known me since I was like 13, 14. Um, all of those guys, Guy Williamson, Grant Davis, um, lo- like loads of them, you mm. know, too many to Eddie Lamb, you know. Yeah. These are all sort still of there. still dear friends of mine sort of thing, yeah. you know. So, so on that level, it's a 10. That sounds know? like a 10. Yeah. So you're the first Seeing Stars guest that said 10 out of 10 and definitely the first one who won the junior ABAs. Mm. Oh. So when did it start then? So when did you start, when did you first go and walk in the boxing gym? I think... Yeah, like, and was it Fitz, Fitzroy Lodge was the first one you went yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. And, but there was, there was two um, uh, clubs, but Freddie Hill as well, there was uh, two um, fighting brothers, the Guilfoyles, um, Mick and Johnny Guilfoyle uh, fought with the Fitzroy Lodge. And they were linked up to um, Freddie Hill, who was one of the great old pro trainers. He trained, uh, he trained um, the Finnegan brothers, Ken Buchanan, you know, like it was a great, great trainer, Freddie Hill. And he had a gym in Battersea. And I remember being up there, it was above a pub. Some great fighters up there. It was like Lloyd Hunnigan and people like that, you know. And, um, and I remember that. I remember watching all the Tyson fights. Like, and again, I think Fred kind of rung my mum and told her we were safe. And it, it was all, all right, you know. And th- if we wanted to go, we couldn't. So we was allowed to go over there. And it was like two in the morning. I remember watching the Pinkland Thomas fight um, in the downstairs pub, the Craven on the Hill pub. But Fred's gym was above that. And there was some great, great fighters come out of that gym, you know, like mm. really great, good pros. And um, so I remember all of that. But it was the Fitzroy Lodge was the one. And I remember walking in there and Steve Bunce was there at the time. And as, as much as he's known for his commentary and his journalism over the years and all of that, he does a lot of work behind the scenes, Steve, for that club, because that was his old club. And, um, and Steve took me, I remember he took me to see the, um, the Olympic squad. It would have been Seoul, 1988. I remember seeing Richie Woodall sparring. I would have been about 14 then. And Steve took me over to Crystal Palace just, just to watch, you know, because I was kind of, um, I think I might have won the Londons by then sort of thing. And, you know, it was, but, um, but that was big stuff, you know, like mm. when you look back, those are really kind of formative years, you know, and, and there was a lot of sort of good people looking out for me. So, um, yeah, but no, Fitzroy Lodge was the first gym I sort of walked into. It was just my local club. I'm from the Elephant and Castle and that gym's in Lambeth. And so it just so happened it was a great gym as well. You know, mm. I was lucky, really. 
It's incredible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What 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 made you want to go to the boxing gym in the first place? Like I don't know. Do, do you know, like it's a it's a good question, right, George? Because I can give neat answers, right? <laughs> but I think it's bigger than that. I think it's just a, you know, I definitely would have seen the Rocky films at the time. Interestingly, um, Barry McGuigan was at his height then. You know, like when he fought Pedroza. Um, and I say interestingly because by coincidence or providence, um, Barry ended up becoming a dear friend, you know, as you know, he, he, um, and that's how I got to meet George, was um, I wrote the film Jawbone and, and ended up training with the McGuigans for a couple of years and they've become dear friends. And So I remember Barry being a massive influence on me when I was a kid. Um, I remember buying the boots that he wore. He used to wear the blue and yellow Adidas boots. And it was the days before the internet, you know, I remember sending off to some PO box thing and, you, you know, you'd be lucky if you got them, you know, and I remember him turning up at Mickey Carney's sports shop. He went as a parcel here for you and just being like buzzed about these boots. So I remember Barry was a massive influence, but I went and saw a play um, when I was younger. Um, I went and saw a play. Um, no, actually, it was the boxing club who took me. So I, I don't know, maybe that was more influential, but, but it was about Mamad Ali's life story. And it was an American actor called Jeffrey C. Ewing and... He played Muhammad Ali, and I've never seen anything like it, you know. But so I don't know. No, that what what made me want to go to the boxing club? I think the Rocky films. I think seeing Barry McGuigan and like there was definitely an intrigue around it. And beyond that, I don't know really. We could get deep and psychological about it, you know. Mm. Like I don't know. I was I was searching for something. I think. Um, but I walked into that boxing club and I found it. Whatever it was, I, I loved it immediately, and I and I kind of fell in love with it. I think there was something about the relative sort of solitude of it as well. You know, I grew up on a estate kind of around that area and stuff. And, and I don't know, for some reason, you know, in those early teenage years, you know, you start to get a bit fearful maybe of, you know, the little gangs around and all of that. And there was something about that boxing club. I just felt safe in there, weirdly. I, mm. I loved it. And it was kind of my little secret place. And, um, and I'd go there and I just loved it. I thrived on it. And, um, yeah, I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Equally that, you mentioned the solitude there, but equally, particularly with places like the Lodge, you hear about the family and the, the yeah. fact you go in there and you've got you've got a family and yeah and if you're feeling a bit isolated when you're out and about in in the area it gives you that it gives you a haven almost yeah do you feel a bit of that as well yeah and i grew up i mean you know i don't know how relevant this is like but i, I grew up my mum raised me on her own you know like on on that estate sort of thing and i i had um a male presence around my uncles and, and things were around and stuff but I don't know. It's, when I look back now in hindsight in that club, people like like Mick Carney was the man who ran the Fitzroy Lush. But you could, you, there's a Mick Carney in every club uh, all over the world, you know? And um, that's why I wrote my film, Jawbone, really. It, it, that film was many things, but it was ultimately really kind of a love letter and a, a thank you note to those men, you know, who when I look back now with hindsight, and sometimes you don't realise it till you're much older, but they really looked after me, you know? And it went far beyond boxing. Mick, like I wasn't going to school. I left school at 13 and my mum kind of rang him and said, look, Mick, you know, the school board people are onto me and they're telling me I'm going to be in, you know, and, and Mick kind of got hold of me and got me an apprenticeship as a locksmith and, you know, and things like that. And um, they were really good men, you know, like good men. And I'm not the only one. Like I could, you know, the reason I think we're all still good friends now and stuff is we've all got that as a common denominator. I think we all got something from that, you know, and some of those lads had dads and stuff so I don't know that was just mm. my story whatever it was I felt um, I found something in there definitely and something cathartic as well there was an energy inside of me that had to come out somewhere and, and that happened a bit later with the acting and, and things I found other ways of pursuing that but you know um, with the boxing thing yeah, you know and also I think again I can only say this with hindsight but sort of spiritual principles you know the, the principle of hard work or the principle of sacrifice things that i became really interested in later in life meditation even in some ways i can kind of liken what i was doing in that gym to meditation or prayer even you know mm. being present completely present i never knew that then but like when i look back now i've explored things like meditation it's a big part of my life and you know um, i look back then and i think you know um when someone's throwing punches at your head, you're present. <laughs> you're not thinking about five seconds up the road. You know, you're, you're, you're as present as you can be. And there's something really kind of cathartic and healing about that, you know? And so what some people would see as maybe a, a... And that's why I wanted to write the film as well. Some people would look at those gyms as scary places, you know, and maybe frightening places and things like that. But for me, it was kind of my church. Mm. It was a place mm. where I went and found solace. And I found some kind of peace, really, that I couldn't find at school or elsewhere um so i was deeply deeply grateful for it you know in later life and 
that's what the film is about, really. While we're on that <clears throat> question for both of you, really, <clears throat> when you think when you talk about that that pull and the allure of boxing, mm. why do you think that boxing does that for kids, whereas football doesn't, or golf doesn't, or cricket doesn't? People do find mm. like some peace with with other sports, but something about boxing, yeah, that delivers that something unique. Mm. Have you ever thought about what what it is about? Boxing, do you, is it the peril? Is it the fact that you can't blag it? Or is there something else? There's, I mean, I guess there's, there's two ways of looking at this. One is as a fighter and what you're getting from it actually in there. And the other is as um, spectators. Because there's something about boxing that I just don't get from, with, with the greatest of respect. Like I, I've got massive respect for any sports person. Mm. But I personally... I don't know whether it's a class thing. I don't know what it is, but I never really got it from, let's say, circuit sports like tennis or something. I kind of always knew that they had next year to go again. Or, you know, like, whereas with boxing, it just felt it's all on, the, like, the sense it's of drama. True. It's all on the line, isn't it? Everything. Everything is on the line. And, and, and then speaking, you know, from within it, what, what you get from it maybe as a, there's a deep intimacy to it. That's really difficult to explain, and I can only explain it to a certain level. I've never like what the what I've seen these guys do at that level is far beyond anything I'll ever understand. But I think there's a deep, deep intimacy to it, and I was always searching for a truth in some way or another, whether that was as an actor or. And uh, there's a few pursuits I've had in life where I was searching for a truth. Maybe some of them I was looking in the wrong place, you know. <laughs> but there was uh, there's an intimacy to boxing when you're looking in the eyes of that man opposite you. There's something that you see in each other. You could argue the entire journey of life. You're seeing, you're seeing every kind of emotion. You're seeing, you're playing God to some degree. You're seeing fear. You're seeing um, sadism to some degree when they've got you and they, there's nothing you can really do about it. And you know and they know, and it's implicit. And I think even if you've got the best front row seats, you can't see that. I think people often wonder why, um, you know, you see the build up to a fight and the animosity that can be conveyed you know in the publicity and all of that stuff and the, the energy and the stare out and the all of that and then at the end of the fight they hug mm. like and a good question is why would they do that what is that that happens there and it's animal you know you've just looked into each other's souls it's as intimate as anything you know as a, as a 15 year marriage like you've just <laughs> seen into each other's eyes you know and even now, some people who I thought, like I thought Barry Jones when I was a kid, and uh, and um, a few other, yeah, Barry Jones, and I thought, and um, uh, Dazza Williams, um, some people, that, you know, and if I see them now and you meet now, there's still like a connection, you know, you're still kind of like, you know, you just hug immediately, and or for me anyway, you mm. know, and and um, because you've shared something, and it's almost like a secret, implicit thing, you kind of know that no one else around you, even the ref, whoever, you know, like they. They haven't seen what I saw in you and vice versa, you know, and I think there's something to that. Who knows? It's mm. all theory, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's really interesting, the mm. way that you're describing it, Johnny. Was you, was you feeling like this while you was a kid boxing? Was you dreaming of being an actor at this point? Was you acting? Or is this something that you sort of worked out as you got older? No, I think like, so like I say, like the, the boxing club, I remember took, took us to see um, that play about Muhammad Ali. I remember being fascinated by that because I knew it wasn't Muhammad Ali, you know, like it was, you know, it was on a stage in the Barbican and um, it was a minimal set and this guy walked out and it was a celebrity audience that night. I remember Barry McGuigan was there. I think Frank Bruno, you know, like all the fighters at the time, Hunnigan. Um, and then like obviously gave a load of tickets to some local juniors and stuff, you know, and I'd never been to the theatre before, and I remember being mesmerised by it, and I remember the whole audience being mesmerised, you know, like, and, and like, what is this thing that this guy's doing? I remember being fascinated by that. Um, but no, the acting thing, I think it, I never thought realistically I could ever do it. I, I ran away, right? So I won the ABAs, and then um, I boxed for Young England, and it was all kind of happening, really. I was in the throes of it, and then I met my first ever little girlfriend. And the previous nine years, I've been in a gym with a load of sweaty blokes, you know. And then this, like, you know, Parisian girl who was just lovely came along and rocked my world, you know. I've got these feelings, you know. It was young love, but um, she had to go back to Paris, and that was it. I gave the boxing up. I went over there. I got a job as a dishwasher. <laughs> how, how old were you then? Um, I would have been 18 then. Yeah. I remember Mick Carney ringing me and going, Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm in Paris, Mick. Bonjour. He said, Well, you better fucking get back. He yeah, said, You're yeah. on, um, you got a fight next week. And that was it. It was over, sort of thing. And I trained out there for a bit. But I never, that was it, it was over sort of thing. And um, 
But if I'm really honest, like, and, and in respect to people who went on and done far more than I did sort of thing, you know, um, I, you know, I can, I can romanticise it and go, well, I met this girl and that was the end of it. But even up in the build up to that, I knew there was something lacking. I remember feeling terror, terror. Even now, like the your call, because I'm over this way a lot and um, I still look at that place and I associate it with terror, like fear, <laughs> like you can't believe, you know, so... I remember that and I remember, you know, and I also remember seeing some of my, um, you know, people of my era, you know, that era, like, you know, Nazim and people like that. I was, that was the same kind of time I was around and, and some of them were like, I don't know, I just, you know, and, I, and if I'm really honest, I kind of fell out of love with it then as well for a bit. There was something happened. And I, again, I think that's what Jawbone was about, was, was that there was a period where I really fell out of love with it and it was only later I realised um, actually just how much it had done for me. And, and I went back and I found my love for it again in a really deep, deep way. Um, but when I was younger, I don't know whether that was fear. I don't know what it was, but, you know, I got political around that time. I remember like, I was listening to The Clash and Bob Dylan for the first time. I started getting political and things. And I remember I never liked the, um, the club shows, you know, the black tie shows. I remember not liking those. I started getting a bit angry about that sort of stuff. And... Um, we used to do shows for the Stock Exchange. And, and I look back now, and they were great. They raised a lot of money for the clubs, and they meant our club could exist and stuff. But I didn't really know that then. I just started to feel like I was entertainment a bit, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was like cigar smoke in your face and go on the red, go on the blue. And I remember just thinking, I don't like this, you know, and, um, and all of that. And so somewhere in amongst it, I just got kind of scared and felt like a bit of a fraud, I think. I remember that. I remember looking at other fighters and thinking, are they as scared as I am? And, um, and I was winning fights on that. I don't know, maybe that energy is what drove me. I don't know. But um, this girl came along and that was it. I was gone. <laughs> yeah. So you still, yeah. watch, you still watch a bit of boxing now. What would you say the best fights you've ever seen in person? And what's the best ones you've seen on the telly? Best fight in person. Um, and I consider this a blessing. Like, you know, it, was, it was at the end of uh, Jawbone. We'd just finished filming Jawbone. So I'd spent two years really in the McGuigan camp with all these guys, you know, with George, um, Carl Frampton, Josh Taylor, Comrade Cummings, you know, David A. Like it was like that was incredible. That weren't lost on me. And I think that's where I found my love for the whole thing again on a whole new level as well. And um, and it was a poignant time. I think the marriage had ended at the beginning of that process and I'd gone through all of that and I came out at the end of it and I would developed a real friendship like with Carl. I'd seen Carl go right through that journey. And, um, and I've got a lot of love for Carl. He's a good man, you know, I really like him. He's a friend. And, um, and I remember, and then he fought Leo Santa Cruz in the Barclay Center in New York. And, um, and I went, and the McGuigans, bless him, sorted us a seat ringside. I was next to Nazim. I had Nazim <laughs> on one side and, and uh, Martin O'Neill on the other. It was just all a bit surreal, you know, it was a bit trippy. And I'd gone on this kind of massive journey myself of making the film, which ain't easy, you know, it's, you go on a journey with that and kind of came out the other side of it. And all of a sudden I was sitting in the Barclays Centre with a lot of love for Carl, you know? And I'd, by this point, you know, I'd got to see what these guys do behind closed doors. You know, what you see happen on those nights, you know, with the lights and the razzmatazz, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg. You know, by this point I was, you know, and George was lo lovely enough to invite me over to his gym over in Hammersmith. And I was watching the day-to-day -day sparring, like really intense stuff. You've got dangerous, dangerous men coming over to the gym, travelling from all over, travelling internationally to come in and do a job on them, you know, and, and it's intense, like really intense. And then the weight loss and stuff, and these guys are away from their families and you really start to feel that. And so by the time I got out to that, that Barclay Center and I saw Carl fight that night for the world title against Santa Cruz, it was big, man, it was big. And the fact that I was there as a person, I couldn't really quite believe that either. Um, Nazim was lovely. It was great because we, <laughs> we had a common opponent in Darren Williams. Like I fought yeah. Darren Williams twice and Nazim fought him and that. So we was just like having a lovely time and he was great, you know, and it was just like, it was an incredible night and, and, and Carl got that, like, it was an incredible fight. Yeah, like, just a whole thing. I'll never, ever, ever forget it. I'll never forget it. And mm. um, that was incredible. Um, but it's been a few of those, you know, like mm. I've had some great nights. Um, mm. Yeah, that was, that was incredible. I remember the night you won the world title and I couldn't be there. I was filming. I was over in um, Iceland, but they set up a radio 
for me. And um, and all of that. And I said, it was like the war, you know, sitting around going, go on, George. And it was like, you know, these those are like great memories, like, you know, that I won't ever forget. And um, what was the other part? It was TV. But when, oh, you yeah. know, when you see a fight like that, with that, when you've got that much invested in, nothing on TV really compares. No, uh, no. It's not I, even close. No, no. I've got great memories of those Tyson fights. Yeah. I, I would have been about 14, 15 then. 14, 15, 16. It was those years when Tyson was fighting um, Buster Douglas, Pinkland Thomas, um, uh, you know, Bone Crusher Smith, those fights sort of thing. And, um, and I remember those. I remember the sense of occasion, you know, and it was quite a grotty little pub really, but it was nighttime. <laughs> it was like, you know, and, and, um, and just being with like the Guilford brothers and, and um, yeah, that, those were special memories. Like, you know, I was a kid then. And then even now, like if I'm if I'm gonna watch a fight, I'll I'll do the whole thing. You know, I get the Doritos and I get you know, I'm set up for it and it's like right, five in the morning, let's mm. have it and Do you you stay up? Yeah. You still yeah. a stay her upper? Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah. No, not a lot. I'm a, I'm no, a lawn man now. No, yeah, no, I can't do it. <laughs> I, I thought I'd pass out about half three otherwise. I missed a couple. Often. I had a couple where I paid the money, you know, I've paid yeah. the 20 quid, got me the read. I've got, you know, I'm ready to go and I've slept through the alarm and I'm fuming <laughs> the next day. So now I know I, I stick it out. And mm. um, but it takes a good, like, it'll take a special fight, like, you know, and um, Spence Crawford, I just did, you know, like, there's a certain fight where I, I think, no, yeah, you've got to be up for it. And yeah, sometimes yeah, you have yeah. to be up. It's not the same next morning. And do you yeah. know what? I, I, it's, I know what you mean about the Tyson fights. At the time, though, you didn't really realise how much of a, how much of an impact on boxing history Mike Tyson had and yeah. those nights and everyone's staying, even in England, everyone's staying up. Yeah. It doesn't really happen much since. Floyd, Floyd Mayweather had a bit of that, mm. but not like that, that visceral, like, we're invested in this guy who's in America who's knocking everyone out. Yeah. It's a mad time, yeah. really. Yeah. You, 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 there was a sense of, you, you kind of knew you was witnessing history, didn't you? You mm. just kind of knew. I, I, I don't know what to plant that on completely, you know, but there was something about his personality, something about, you know, even the way he dressed, just everything about it. And um, you knew there was a sense of history happening in front of you. Yeah, you're right. I'm, mm. I'm trying to think. I mean, some incredible fights now, like building up and brewing up and, um, you know, but, yeah, no, there was, there was, there, yeah, it was special. It mm. was, there was something incredible about that. Yeah. But you're right when you talk about having um, an emotional investment or just any investment in a fight, it just makes it so much more better, so much more brilliant, like just to be part of the, the main event, to watch the fight and obviously if they do win, when they win, yeah. the feeling after. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, obviously I've been in gyms before. It's like, you're lucky, it's, you still, I still see it as a privilege if I'm part of someone's, camp even if it's just as a spectator seeing a bit of the behind the scenes or you know behind closed doors yeah by the time you get to um yeah fight week and fight night it just it just makes it that much more interesting i mean yeah. did you have any can you think of any where you were really like nervous or like maybe people in your camp or people that you trained alongside and you were like sitting there thinking this is this is major because it was happening for you yeah. every, every few weeks i guess but so like on the right with David Hay, so Dave, yeah. the first time David Hay fights the the giant Valuev, you know, mm. um, in Nuremberg, I fight on the undercard, um, and I'm still just like a sponge trying trying to just learn on the job, but just be part and present and be a team player if anything, you know, and uh, yeah, to see him win that night, I didn't even understand the, the fraction of the boxing politics, you know, really, yeah. like I thought you, no one gets a points decision in Germany, it's like. You do if you do a deal with a Sowlers beforehand, you know. Uh, it's like the whole time I was scratching my head going, you sure you're going to try and nick a win? Like, anyway. Um, but yeah, being over the moon, David Hay did did, did the job that night. And then probably recently would be Chris Billum Smith winning the of world course, title. Yeah. Because you're like, yeah. you know, I met Chris before he turned pro. Has he turned pro? He's always been... a you know, a loyal supporter of mine. Um, Big underdog on the night as well. And then, and just when it's an under, when you're an underdog and you, you've, it's, it's, it's got that dramatic, it's got that Hollywood, that, that sort of, yeah. that sort of think and feel that, um, yeah, them nights, you know, you're like, oh, it's unbeatable. Mm. You know? We'll get on to your, we'll get on to your films and all your work in a sec, but we can't, go on from this bit without asking about boxing Barry Jones. We've had him on the pod, <laughs> yeah. the league club member, everyone loves Barry. What, so what was that? That was um. What, I, what was the context? What sort of age were you? It was um. So we would have been about sixteen, um, yeah, sixteen, and um, I think it was um. I can't remember if it was on the way to the junior ABAs. I've I've, I've had a blank with that. I can't remember, or if it was just a club fight, you know, yeah. like London Wales. 
a Cardiff kind of club fight. Um, I can't remember. And I, and I, I also can't remember if we fought twice. I think me and Barry had this out last time we spoke like, and I, I'm, I think we thought, fought twice, but I can't remember now. Anyway, but we definitely fought once. And um, yeah, and, and my memory was it might have been one of the divs kind of thing on the way mm. to, a, to a championship sort of thing. And um, yeah, and I won on points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think it was twice because Barry made a joke. He said, "If you beat me, I th- he come up like <laughs> years later, right?" Oh, we, so you, you we were hugged. tuning up. Uh, yeah, I, th- I think I might. Have, I think it might have been. Sorry, Barry, if I'm, <laughs> I'm embellishing this, but he did make the joke. He said, "If you beat me a third time, I'll come and sit on your mantelpiece." <laughs> he said, "You get to keep me on you." Um, but yeah, I th- but we were really young, you know. And they would have been, you know. In fairness to Barry, I should, uh, you know. But um, they were like three round fights. Could have gone either way, mm. even t- you know, like that was kind of amateur. Easy, fights, but yeah, it was easy work. Easy it was work. A, no, 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 yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> no, you know, the decision could have gone either way, and it, you know, mm. but he was, um, yeah, he's lovely, Barry, good man, and mm. he said, yeah. So yeah. we met, we met in McGuigan's gym. I'd sort of just started working with Shane. You must have been already there, Johnny. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so. I was, I was like, who's this guy? Who's he fighting? Yeah, <laughs> he's like, yeah. that's Johnny he's, um, yeah. he's from the lodge. I was like, all right. And he said, he's an actor. He's making a film. I was like, oh, cool. And I don't know if you, were you doing any pads with Barry at the time? Or was it with Shane? Like, Shane. Yeah. Shane, yeah. Shane, yeah. Because I'm sure Barry would have been there critiquing. No, Barry took me around a few times, yeah. 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 But, um, yeah. And then, <laughs> that must have been surreal for someone who's bought his boots on P.O. Box. Yeah, and... trippy. He, 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 um, he, he smashed me in the ribs. <laughs> Just once he'd done it, you know, but it was enough where you're like, wow. <laughs> I, you know, and um, yeah, back over at their old gym and he took me on the pads once. But no, Shane was, it was mostly for Shane on the pads and stuff, yeah. So we yeah. talk about the film Jawbone, which you wrote um, and you star in. Tell us a little bit, you told us a little bit before we started, but tell us a little bit about the process of that. When did it first become an idea? When did, when did you want to first make this movie? Yeah, it evolved. Like, uh, There's a friend of mine, Adam Smith, he's a director, right? And um, we'd done loads of music videos together back when I was young and he was young and we were starting out. And then he was doing a music video. He rang me up one day and said, listen, I've, I've got the camera. Like, I'm doing a video, but they've let me bring the camera home. Let's go and make a short film. Like, you know, because we weren't really getting any work. And so he said, come on, I'll get a gym. Anyway, he got the Repton. And so we went over to the Repton. He went, you bring a character, I'll bring the camera. And, we'll... and we made this like little hodgepodge of a little sort of comedy thing. Really. It was like The Office. Or it was, you know, <laughs> it's a long way from what Jawbone ended up becoming. But, um, but that was the start of it. And Adam was touting that around, you know, trying to get work for himself. And these two producers, Mike Elliott and, and, um, and Chris Collins, who, who ran a bit, was at the BFI at the time, took a liking to it. There was something about this character that they liked. And that was it. It evolved out of that. And they had a writer in who was working on it and it wasn't really working with him and Adam. They kept clashing around ideas and stuff. And so for one reason or another, there was a deadline approaching and Mike just stepped in and went, right, look, because by that point I had loads of, you know, I was chipping my oar in quite a bit because it was about boxing. And I, and I, th- I thought, well, if I'm going to make a film about boxing, it's really precious to me, you know, and mm. I don't want to make some Wally-ish movie, you know, like it's, it's got to be right or I'm not doing it at all. And, um, so with that kind of spirit in mind, or that kind of fearlessness, uh, fear, fear, I guess, of getting it wrong, I, I was quite passionate about what I wanted to do with it. And someone amongst that, Mike said, right, here's the deal. You've got to write it. <laughs> That's it. And Chris Collins from the BFI said that uh, I ended up writing this 12-page thing, and there was something in it that they saw. And they came back and went, right, here's the deal. We're going to fund it. We're going to fund the writing of it, the developing of it. But the deal is you're going to write it, and you're going to have no interference. It's going to be you and you alone. Let's see where it goes. And I was nervous. I left school at 13. I'm not like a trained writer. But then, you know, I had about 20 years of acting on my belt, you know, so I've read plenty. I've, I've spent 20 years moaning about bad scripts or what <laughs> yeah. I thought were bad scripts. <laughs> so are you doing, point, mate? <laughs> yeah, this is it. At some point, you, you know, you either carry on moaning all your life or you have a go yourself. And, um, and that was it. That was the start of it. And then it took seven years between starting writing it and us actually sort of making it and filming it. But over that seven years, there was just like different drafts. Um, yeah, and then about five years into that, I started training with the McGuigans. Um, Paul Weller came on board. Um, a friend gave my script to Paul Weller. He ended up writing the soundtrack for the film. His dad, John Weller, was an ABA champion. Uh-huh. Um, so it just all sort of, like, a lot of weird sort of providence started to happen. I'd done a movie with uh, Ray Winston. We'd done Snow White and the Huntsman together with Ian McShane as well. And so I ended up meeting those two guys and we just became friends. Like the, the friendship stuck after the film. And Ray and I would be talking about boxing all the time because Ray was a good fighter. You know, he fought for the Repton and, and he, he loved it as much as I did. 
So we played the um, the dwarves in Snow White and the Huntsman. So yeah, we'd be sat yeah. around on set dressed as dwarves with our <laughs> big fake asses on and big eggs and you know, like you know, we had all this like masses of makeup. Um and um, we just sit around talking about um and I think Ray's trainer at the time, Jackie from the Repton um, passed away. And it wasn't long after Bill Webster at the Fitzroy Lodge had passed away. So we ended up talking really poignantly about these men who were really important in our lives. And it was somewhere in and around that as I was writing and it just started to evolve then. I knew it evolved then. I knew it was going to be a really personal film. I knew it was going to be a love letter to that club and, and men like that. And, and I also knew that I wanted Ray to play. It just started to come together, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, bit by bit. Yeah. Was, it, was that the most nervous... Nerves probably nerves probably the wrong, but because you had s- such a it had such sentimental value to it. Yeah, were you pouring over it like nothing else? Yeah. You were like, this has to be yeah. perfect. Is and, this and right? Am I getting kind it of right? the legacy really of Mick? Um, if that's not too, you know, um, egotistical a word to use, I hope you know Mick would would like what we did with the film. But the, you know, it was um, it was it was a big thank you note to that man and Bill Webster and Freddie Hill and people like those. Um, for Ray, it was a, a for Tony Burns, he said that to me. He said, "You've written us about Mick, haven't you?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, I'm going to play it for Tony." Is that all right? And I said, yeah. "Yeah." And it was lovely. And and George, you'll have your version. You know, yeah. Those those men, you know, great people, heroes. I really think they're heroes. You know, mm. they turn up under those railway arches day in day out, and they change lives. And it might not be that you become a world champion like George, or you know, but they. I know people who've um, lives have been changed by those years at those clubs, and so. Um, I think once I knew it was going to be that, yeah, I got a bit scared <laughs> and I got a bit nervous, you know. And there's been a lot of boxing films that, for whatever reason, for me, didn't quite hit the mark, you know. But there were really good people involved, you know. Like Day Lewis made a, a boxing movie, and like you know, sort of fight scenes. I, 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 you know, I just couldn't help but think that there was something we could do that could maybe elevate it, or something maybe that hadn't been done before. Um, you know, and it's easy to say that in hindsight now, but it was nerve wracking, you know, because you're thinking, what if we get it wrong? Um, you know, those guys are still my friends. I still go into the Fitzroy Lodge a lot now and I thought I'll never live it down, you know, like they'll never forgive me. So um, I was nervous, yeah, I mm. was nervous. But that was good. That was, in hindsight, I look back and realise it was fuel to get so it right. You know? It takes seven, it took you seven years. And yeah. what's that like? Is that frustrating? Yeah. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you, you won't let it go or do you have to let it go and just keep coming back when it, when it, when it, comes back to the surface to be honest it was it was um did it have, sorry did it evolve like did yeah. the story evolve a lot in those yeah those and I, if i'd have known it was going to be seven years i might never have started you know it's the <laughs> truth of it. you go no that's all right i'm just gonna crack on with what i'm doing but um it wasn't it was kind of like moving goalposts and i realize now that that is the business that's just how it works but i was quite naive at the time i'd never mm. produced or or been involved in the production side of something i'd always come into something as an actor once it's developed and produced and ready to go we come in then and, and it's like, go green light. Um, but um, so, you know, the financiers and stuff would do what they do, really. They set these kind of deadlines, but they're kind of fake deadlines just to keep it moving and keep yeah. things in development. But I didn't know that. So I was like, I, I went and found Barry McGuigan or, or my producer, Mike, gave him a call. And you know, he was my hero, like genuinely my hero. And, you know, and, and Paul Weller. And so I was going over and meeting them and I was doing it on a handshake. And it was my handshake, which means a lot to me. So I was saying to them, yeah, we're making this film. We're going to start shooting in a year's time because that's what I was being told. And Barry was like, great, come in. Let's get you started, man. We've got work to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so we were cracking on. And then like two years later, and we're still at it. And, and they've moved the goalposts financially and stuff. And it wasn't malicious or anything. It's just how it goes. It takes a lot to produce a film and to get it all together and schedules and get the scripts right and everything and the crew and and so, you know, but but by the end of it, we was having these meetings with these kind of financiers at the BFI. And I was in there with a splattered nose. Shane McQuiggan splattered my nose <laughs> once. I remember it was all, <laughs> my nose was, and my eardrum went and stuff. And so I was in these meetings. I was losing my rag in the end. I was like, this ain't fun. You know, like, <laughs> this, this, we're not playing this, you know, like, yeah. are we making this film or not? And so uh, I think there was something even good about that in the end, though, because it was like, if we're not making it, we're done. Because yeah. I've got serious people here, like Barry McQuiggan and that, you know, and, and, to be fair, those guys weren't doing it for the money and stuff, you know, like they were giving, they were really generous to me, really, really generous. Paul Weller, would al- he'd already written the score pretty much by then. Yeah. And so it kind of forced the hands of the financial people in the end. It was like, are we in or not? Mm. So after seven years of to and fro and everyone was finally like, all right, let's go. And and that was it. We we made it. Yeah. Let's talk about the, the training process. So how often were you in, were you in the gym? What were you doing with, with Shane? What were you doing with Barry? Like what was your day to day? 
Yeah. So so over the two years, right, like like the first part of it initially was weight loss and stuff. Like when I got mm. in there, I was not I hadn't I hadn't stepped foot in a gym really in in maybe fifteen years or something, you know, like and 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 um and so initially it was just even about, you know, shedding a lot of, you know, a lot of excess weight and um and and just the initial stuff and just getting back in a gym and 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 then also they had to really kind of I still had that very sort of, I was like flyweight when I won the title so I was very sort of up on my toes free round fight but all speed and you know and so the McGuigan's try to settle me get me looking much more like a sort of a pro and so it was really rudimentary at the beginning and it was quite slow and it was all of that and then like I say the film would would pause or you know would get paused and so I'd go off and do an acting job um, but the final six months in of that two years the final six months was every day like we'd be in every day and i was just trying to do what the fighters were doing then like what carl and i saw you guys doing where well, you'd just be in every day and that was it and um and and doing the same thing as what they was doing you know my diet was was um by that point was really on point we changed the body you know uh, got a lot leaner and you know got that part right and um yeah and then we was um, doing sparring and yeah lots and lots of pads with um with shane I loved it in the end. I did love it, you know. And something happened, like uh, you know, even with, you know, stuff that you can't fake or you can't. I remember being on a bus home with the headaches and stuff and things like that, and I'd forgotten that stuff and, um, and the adrenaline and the nerves of being in the gym and stuff, you know. Like I remember even the, the fear came back even with sparring. I remember, <laughs> you know, their gym was near Battersea Park, yeah. And they say, oh, we've got this lad coming over to spar you today and all of that, and I'd be walking around that park and boom, boom, boom. boom Ba boom, you know, and the heart going and all of that. And <laughs> that's when my respect for you guys went through the roof. Mm. I, I couldn't do it at that level, but it was, um, yeah, it was great, man. It was good. You know, so you get fit and you're back in the gym. Mm. Uh, are you not thinking, right, I'm going to pop down the lodge, get yeah. some sparring. I'm yeah. going to ask my old card back. The, yeah. <laughs> get me out. No. Get me on the club show. <laughs> they was talking, the, the McGuigans mentioned at one point the idea of doing um, a kind of a behind closed doors fight, you know, like, and they said, like, well, I think it might be good for you. Get, really, really get the fear going. <laughs> And you know, and I did that polite thing of going, yeah, no, that's good. And inside, I'm thinking, Fuck that. <laughs> excuse my language, but yeah, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> but no, I remember that was was spoken of, and we was going to do that, I think. And um, but it never happened. I think something happened. I think I, you know, and I should mention as well Scott Lawton and stuff because the McGuigans got me ready, and they it was it was the McGuigans. Barry was there. Um, he he oversaw the fight. We wanted to get it really real, you know, like it had to be real for for many reasons as well, not just because I wanted to get it authentic, you know, for boxing fans watching the film and stuff, and for my old boxing friends. But it represents something as well. The film's also about addiction, you know, and um and and there's a there's a stage within addiction, like you know, just before someone either breaks or asks for help. You know, it's like they say a candle flame burns brightest just before it goes out. It doesn't want to die. You know, if you watch a candle flame dying, it like a white heat happens. It doesn't want to die. And that's the same with addiction. You have to be at that stage where you go, please help me. Or you break and you can't take it anymore. And um, and the fight had to represent that white heat where it was in the story. And so we had to get that right. I needed the audience to feel that level of intensity. They needed to be in the ring with him and, and to know what that felt like. So at the end, when he says help me or whatever it is that happens, you know, it, you feel that relief that sense of relief otherwise the addiction thing wouldn't have made sense so we knew we needed the fight to be as real as we could get it you know mm. and barry was there overlooking it and um you know he was great man he was he was i, I give full credit to um barry and our stunt team and that were great as well but but barry was um he was the difference i think you know mm. yeah we done the first funny story. You got to type like he, yeah, you know. We done the first round with, and it was a build up to this thing. And Luke Smith, uh, the actor who came in and played the opponent, he was a real fighter. You know, he you know some good fights, and um, he was great. So we'd and we'd rehearsed it. You know, we knew we were going to go for it. We were going to let shots go, and uh, you know, it had to be choreographed for the cameras and stuff. But once we were in position, that we were going to let shots go, and we both knew we were ready to go there. And um, and so, you know, film people aren't used to that really. And all the extras were there, hundreds of extras, and they're all around. And we never told them that we were going to kind of really let loose. And, and so um, this build up happened, and you could feel it. You could feel the tension, and the producers were really worried because they knew kind of there was, you know. And then all of a sudden, it's built up and built up, and Barry's there, and hundreds of extras, and it's action, and we've gone at it. Crash. And we have four days. We knew we were going to do this over four days, continuous fighting. And we've done the first scene, the first take of it, and action, and we've gone out and real shots and you felt it the crowd started to go Rawr! and it, it went off like you know and, and we're having it and whatever and we got to the end of it and cut and everyone went mental like the extras were going 
what's going on? And all of that. You still remember, throwing punches? Yeah, yeah no, well, it was. It really went nuts. Like, and, and you know, and there was already a swelling and everything, and, and all of that. And um, it was like, you know, it was it was exciting. And I remember the director got up on the ring and went, "Oh my god, it looks incredible. Are you all right? Are you all right?" And and all of that. And everyone was buzzing and couldn't believe how good it was. And then Barry, I could see him come through the crowd, and he'd been watching on the monitor. And everyone's buzzing and going, "It's great, it's great." And then Barry got up and went, "It's just not good enough, guys. Do you want this or not?" Yeah. You know, he was on another level, you know. And then he just kept that, and it kept us going for five days, like at that intensity. He got stuff out of us that you probably wouldn't get out of people normally on a film set, you know. Mm. Um, so, did you write the fight scenes? Like yeah. I've heard, like Sylvester Stallone talk about literally scripting the fight scenes in Rocky. Yeah. So that is that the best way to do it? Do you think then to I did it in the end, like where it was like literally up every sort of because the thing with it is George as well. Like, was it? It's um, it, it there's a journey within the fight. Yeah, you know, like spiritually, you know, the stuff that's said in the corner, Michael Smiley's character, the corner man, mm. you know, the stuff that he's saying, every line that he says really is kind of almost a metaphor for addiction as well, or for what it takes to potentially overcome addiction. It's, um, you know, he's using words like let go, you know, like you've got to let them go now, like, you know, so that could be about your punches and it is um, narratively in the film, but it's also double meanings. It's all double meanings. So what happens at the beginning of that fight to, to the end of it is a complete story just within itself, really. There's an archetypal journey within that fight. So it had to be, you know, like what's happening to him in the corner between each round is really specific, you know. And um, So, yeah, it was all, all written. Yeah. Mm. What was it like going back to normal work after something doing something that special and that intense for you and obviously being the writer and everything, just going back and acting after that? Oh, that's a good question. How did, how did that feel? I'm trying to think what project I did after that. Um, I know I took I took time out. I remember that deliberately just took a lot of time out. Needed a breather. Yeah, Let no, the swelling I, go down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a good photo yeah, of me um, after the fifth day of there, and I got a face like a bag of spuds. And it's a funny story about that as well, you know, because you don't normally, you know, the truth is right. We wouldn't have got insured if we'd have told them we was going to do that. We we wouldn't have got insured. And the way we got round it, we had a we had a British Boxing Board of Control. We had to have a, a doctor. Mm. Um, I, the Sultan, Do, uh, Dr. Sultan, he, he was ringside. He had to be ringside and he had to check it all and, and all of that. So we, it was all kind of official how we'd done it, but we, we wouldn't have got insured is the truth of it. If we just told the financiers and stuff, we're going to be throwing real shots. And, you know, I got a cut, my eardrum went, Luke's rib went. There was a lot of like, you know, and so the next day I looked, I looked like a right state, but um, <laughs> I remember when Shane cracked my nose open, it was early on in the process. Like, and I'd gone in and we was, we was uh, sparring, right? But Shane was taking it easy, you know? And I just walked onto a left hook. <laughs> he turned one over on me, crack. And it was a split right across my nose. It was like Colin Jones, you know? The yeah. And, um, and, and, um, and claret everywhere. Like it looked a lot worse than it was really. It was a but it was claret everywhere. And so I took a selfie of it and I sent it to three people, right? I sent it to my agent to my producer, Mike Elliott, and, uh, and to Ray Winston. And uh, Ray was, uh, anyway, so my producer immediately, he's thinking of insurance, he's worried about a claim and that. He's like, who saw it? Well, yeah. you know, I went, don't worry, Mike, it's all all right, you know? My lovely agent, Samira, you know, like she's, you know, she was like, oh my God, darling, is there an ambulance on the way? You know, like she's like, oh. and then Ray come back, he went, keep your fucking hands up. <laughs> and I thought, well, oh, yeah, that's your three different worlds yeah. right there, you know? And, um, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. What like, what what would you like on set with other actors? So you you're, you're acting, but you're not directing. And is it all going the way you have visualized it for the last seven years? And if it's not, do you have to suffer in silence, or can you say, Ray, sorry, like <laughs> he would not stand the way you're standing. <laughs> That's no, a dodgy tell you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? Like the one film where I would have would have really felt it, I guess, would have been Jawbone because I wrote it. But like honestly, I'm not I'm not sitting on the fence here, and I'm not trying to be polite. Right? There was just some beautiful providence happened with it. Like with everything about that film, the people who came on board just got it. Ray got it immediately. You know? Do you know the only thing I was worried about with Ray? Right? I sent him the script kind of a bit sneakily. I sent him it and just said, Ray, would you have a read? I just want to see if you think I've got that world right. You know, the kind of British amateur clubs you know like i said you get the spirit if it just had but you know and i didn't mention about him doing it or anything like that and anyway and he, and he took it and he didn't get back for a little while i think it was about a month or so and i thought oh, maybe he hates it or um and it was like midnight or something and i phone when it was ray i went hello ray he went hello son he went i just read your film 
And I went, all right, all right. I went, do you like it? He went, it's beautiful. He went, it's really lovely, John. He says, it's a lovely bit of work, son. He says, about Mick, isn't it? I went, yeah, you know. And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we got to the end. He went, you're going to fucking ask me or what? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, um, and I said, um, you interested, Ray? He went, yeah, I'd love to. I said, what part? Because I thought he might want to come on and do the little cameo that, you know, Ian's part was one scene. And he said, no, I want to, want to play the trainer. And that's when he said, you've written about Mick, haven't you? He said, I'm, I'm going to play it, Tony Burns. Mm, yeah. and there's loads of little tiny little subtle things he does. And it is Tony. You can just see it. It's beautiful, you know, really lovely. And um, I veered off the question. I can't think, what was the, the uh, oh, if people, yeah, he never changed the line, you know. He yeah. never changed a single line. Because often you can debate it when you're on set and you go, oh, this isn't quite working. He never changed a single line. He just, he just got it from day one. Mm. And it was the same with everyone, even with Paul. Uh, Weller, you know, like he, he, Paul said from the beginning, he said, I'm not going to write any songs. I, I, I want to get inside the character's head. I want to do a score that's in the first person. I want the audience to feel what it's like to be in the character's head. Is that all right with you? Because I don't want to do like a, you know, what Weller's like. He, he didn't want to do just what everyone else does. You know, he mm. said, I want to do something different. And then right at the last minute, he rang me up. I think we were close to shooting. And he said, listen, mate, I think I've got a song. He said, I've got this idea and it's about when you sit by the river. I told him about how I used to sit by the river and things. And he, he just said, I've got this idea, man, about, you know, you said the river was almost talking to you or you was looking for answers, you know. And he said, yeah. And, um, and I remember then, if I'm honest, I got a bit nervous then because I thought, oh, you know, what if it's no, again, he's one of my idols, you know, like artistically. Um, yeah. And I thought, what, what if I don't like it? And what if, and then I heard it and I, I got emotional. Like, you know, I, I won't lie. I got emotional as soon as I heard it. And. They all just got it. Mm, yeah. Every single one of them just got it. And people like Barry and, you know, behind the scenes as well, they all just got what we were trying to do, you know? That must have been the absolute seal of approval from Ray to do the, not even change the line, but also to agree to do the part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it was, um, yeah, yeah. I still pinch myself now. Mm. Still pinch myself now, you know? And, and then when I see what he done with it as well, you know, like it, it's just, you know, it's beautiful. Really beautiful performance. You know, I'd seen him do Neil by Mouths and I'd seen him like explosive, like terrifying performances, but this is so sort of gentle. And I just think he got the essence of those men, you know, and, and that's all we really wanted to do. That's what the film is. Mm, it's, right. a, it's a homage to, to those men and he nailed that, you know, it was beautiful. It's amazing how so many of these clubs are the same. Yeah. Like, and then it's relatable to anyone who came through an amateur boxing scene. And I don't think it's not just like London, you know, like no. you're talking about London clubs, Repton. I can talk about it through, through it's not even just England. Youth. Yeah. But it's you go like I mean, I don't know Anywhere about beyond yeah, beyond, but um I'd meet up with fighters, you know, when you start going to England squad and stuff like that, and they'd be coming over from Liverpool or Manchester or Newcastle. And it's always the coach, you know, they might look yeah. different, but they are the same, you know, they yeah. are the same. Yeah. Um <clears throat> And it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's brilliant. It's fascinating. And you do talk about it from, from an arts point of view, you know, mm. which is um, sort of a way that the vast majority of us couldn't, you know, put together. Yeah, it's true. In the way, in the but way I think you they're linked. It. Going back to your um, question earlier, I think like, you know, whatever it is I find in storytelling, I think, you know, listen, there's loads of different versions of it, you know, there's big blockbuster things and whatever, but ultimately, storytelling in its earliest forms you know sitting around a fire was was a way for society to connect you know and and to to explore um ourselves as individuals you know you can do that safely kind of thing in a story uh you know you you, you can act those things out you know the big bad wolf you know these kind of archetypal stories about what you do in life and what you don't sin versus virtue and things like that and i think sport is the same i think they're like man-made this is just my theory but like these kind of man-made constructs whether it's 12 rounds um, or whether it's the length of a play on a stage, but essentially what you've got is a start and a finish, a, a first bell and a last bell. And, and within that space of time, there's a set of rules that have been constructed by a man, and it's a safe place within that to play God, essentially. Mm. You're about to play God with another person. You're, you're, you're about to go beyond what it's safe to go beyond, sometimes outside of the ring or the stage. And they're always followed, interestingly, by an act of humility. You know, two fighters hugging at the end of a fight or a handshake or, you know, and or an actor taking a bow, you know, and, and you know, you know, on an animal level when it's not observed, you know, like if two fight, if one fighter doesn't want to have it, something in the crowd doesn't like it. 
it's animal. It's not like the crowd sit and discusses it, but they start booing. They don't like that 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 thing on an animal spiritual level hasn't been observed. Or if you see an actor who clearly still thinks he's above the rest of the audience, you know, as he's taking the bow, he's still, you know, it's a bit pompous or a bit, people don't like it. It's, it's meant to be an act of humility. And, and it's like, okay, we cease playing God now. I think, you know, mm. like, so, um, yeah, it's deep, man. These things yeah. like two, two men fighting um, within a set of rules and stuff. Like it's as deep as it gets, I think. You know? There's when Tyson beats Burbick, I think he does. He does yeah. that. Yeah, the ultimate yeah. act of humility. Yeah, and people think it's in. It's my. It's arrogance. Like he couldn't touch me, but it is yeah. that. Yeah, that moment of being humble. Yeah, the ultimate sort of position. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he's incredible, Tyson. As mm. well, even now when I listen to interviews and stuff, you know, he's yeah, uh, incredible human being. Like an incredible human being. Very easy to underestimate it. I think. I, mm. I think we won't realize it till he's gone. Um, he's a titan in himself. You know, and he's very deferential, like when they, you know, if he's compared to Ali and people like that, and they go, well, Ali's a great spiritual man. I think we'll look back on Tyson with uh, with uh, similar kind of um, eyes, you know, mm. very different human beings, very different mm. lives that they've lived and, and all of that. And I know there's darkness in there amongst, um, you know, but I think he's um, he's an incredible human being. He's understanding of spiritual concepts and stuff. I find fascinating, you know. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's super clever, mm. isn't he? Yeah, he's he brings your... that to his boxing. Like, you know, his knowledge yeah. of boxing is intertwined with it's insane, what spiritual it... knowledge. Yeah. yeah, and he's your ultimate podcast, isn't he? Actually, yeah. it was Johnny first, wasn't it? And then yeah, John Tyson was second on the right too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are the same. Yeah. Um, just what you mentioned there about Ray playing like explosive and terrifying mm. characters. Wanted to ask you about your This Is England character, because obviously oh. a lot of people will know you from that and will be like, that's one of the, the nastiest characters that they've come across in TV before. Yeah. Yeah. How, what's that? How, do you, how do you play that? Like, how do you go about like, assuming that role and carrying it out? And then like, what's that process like? I mean, it'd be different for different people. You know, what I say is not an authority on it sort of thing. But I, I think for me, you know, I'm, I'm, if I'm trying to do anything, it's the same thing again, really. I'm trying. I'm interested in the spiritual makeup of human beings. You know what it is that drives us, whether it's the seven sins or the seven virtues, the kind of battle or the dance between the two of them. On any given day, we're all trying to. We know the difference between right and wrong, and um, and and like if I'm playing someone who clearly is bedeviled by the sins, you know, like or the, or this man, like complete self-centeredness. Um. I'm interested in that. Like, I'm not interested in playing like a baddie. Yeah. You know, I think there's a difference between sort of playing someone, you know, who you're you're trying to be bad. You know, like I don't think that's what it's really about. I think um, you're playing someone who's um, essentially trying to be good <laughs> and can't get there because there's something inside that's gone wrong, and the root of the problem is always themselves. And I think great drama is is in recognizing that um, they don't realize that they're still blaming everyone else. And so thank God, you know, in my own life, I've, you know, I've never been bedeviled like Mick has around that. You know, he was, um, a, a, you know, a sexual predator or whatever, you know, and thank God that's not my, you know, bedevilments. But um, we've all had to some degree that battle between dark and light, you know, um, even if it's in preparation for a boxing fight or something like, you know, you, you, there's something inside of you there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, and so I'm just always interested in that and exploring that and putting it on a screen, you know, because like I say, that might bring something to other people, you know, um, so I'll veer off your question. I always digress. Sorry, mm. but um, I, um, I'm, I'm just interested in, in working it out. It's like a puzzle, really, a bit like you with your yeah, Ruby Cube, George, yeah. mate. It's, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's almost like going setting about a puzzle, you know, and when you get a character who is that dark, it's like, what is the root of this? Where is he coming from? What is going on? Can I find that, you know? Um, can I bring life to that? Can I, can I help an audience watch that and tap into it in some way? You know, that's when it becomes really frightening, I think, for an audience to watch is when even when someone as hideous as that or, you know, or whose behaviour is as hideous as his is, you see something of yourself in there. That's when I think it gets really... What's it like when, when a piece of work like that comes your way, you know, a script, and you read it, are you nervous? You're like, this is, this is a big, big task. <laughs> mm. Or are you excited because it's such a challenge? Are you ever nervous about the audience like interpretation of what it is whether it feels like if you play it too well would it be a representation of yourself 
I'll tell you what's interesting. Right? I've only just thought of this now, right? There is definitely something about me because different actors have different methods and I've worked with all sorts of people. Some people can sit around joking beforehand and there's all different ways. There's no right or wrong. But I do still have a mentality. It's almost as if I'm preparing for a fight. Yeah. I've still got that mentality. And I don't know about you, Jules, right? You know, like people talk about hometown advantage and stuff. I used to hate it. I used to hate fighting in London. And like all my loved ones and people, you know, and it got bigger, the crowd got bigger as it got close, you know, as a, the fights got, you know, once I won the title and things. I, I hated it. And I never lost outside of London. Something would happen. I'd come alive when I'd go to Wales or Cardiff or somewhere. Like, I, something happened. I just, I felt less nervous and I felt less tension. And, um, and it's the same when I go away to work. Like, I love getting on a train and it's as if I'm going to work somewhere, even when I begin prep. Um, but I remember with the This Is England, um, I think with that one for me it was really mixed emotions because it was a it was a big break for me, like and up until then I'd, I'd done a film called London to Brighton which had done really well critically, but not many people had seen it and it kind of came and went. That was five years previously, and in that five years, despite that film doing really really well, nothing really happened. You know, I was getting auditions for little parts, but they weren't inspiring me. You know, like whether it was ego or whether it was just ambition or 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 um, I, I wanted to be doing good work. I wanted to be doing work. I knew I put the work in, you know, like for what I lack in some areas, um, I'm never going to not put the work in, you know? And um, so I wanted to play roles that um, gave justice to that. You know, there's no point in putting all that work in and then having one line and no one sees it, you know? And so I was frustrated and I was working in um, a cafe at the time in the Union Theatre, you know, and it, so it just weren't happening. I was really, really skint. And I, I, I was that close to giving up. And then almost, it, what felt like out of nowhere, this phone call came and they went, Shane Meadows wants to meet you for this new project he's got. And I was a massive fan of the film. I think that I still do think that film's one of the greatest films internationally, bar none. It's in my top five. Um, and so it was, it was on one level, I couldn't quite believe it. I, could, I had to lend the money to get up to Sheffield for the audition, for, uh, to Nottingham for the audition. And um, and I was running to get the train home and Shane called and said, listen, mate, I just want to make your trip home a bit easier. If you want the part, it's yours, you know. Mm. And I remember sitting on that train home, just like a massive emotions. Like it, it was kind of, it was, it was emotional. And I, I can't explain that, you know. But it was just this strange feeling on one level of like, oh, like it just felt like everything was going to be all right. And I, can't, I don't know what that even means. Um, and, yet, and And then it kind of hit me, oh my God, the nerves of, what if we messed the film's legacy up? And, you know, it's yeah. one of my favourite films. And that stuff started to kick in. And then somewhere amongst it, you just step up, didn't you? And one day at a time, you turn up. And someone once said that, that you know, 90% of success is turning up. And you know what it's like. Some days <laughs> you must have been terrified, George, you know? Yeah, you I know what you mean, turning yeah. up, didn't you, you know? Um, well, I don't know. Was it for you? I'm often intrigued by that. Yeah, not, not like Fight Night. No, I just loved it, reveled in it. You really? Know? And, yeah, you always thought like, oh, I'm put on this planet to do it. but but. The point of always showing up, I mean, that gives you the um, the confidence, self assurance in being able to execute the job because yeah. you you don't miss. You know, you, I love to say, you know, I was first one in, last one out yeah. at the amateur gym, and it's like it's because I was always waiting for a lift home. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I never missed. Didn't miss. You know, you didn't miss. You you got there, you did it. Never missed the squad training. Never missed a fight. You know, you're always there, always present, and. You know, that's, I suppose that you is know what's right. funny, right? Well, at the Fitzroy Lodge, right, there was a there was an old trainer called Howard Rainey back in the day, a big super heavyweight. He was a um, good fighter himself. Anyway, he became a trainer down the lodge, right? And they was it was it was a ramshackle at the time. They was building it and or, or refurbishing it, and it was like an old building site. And it was in my earliest days there, and um, and then they they gave out a little award. Um, and it was um, Fighter of the Week award. And I don't even know how long it lasted, right? But Howard said, right, we're going to do this Fighter of the Week award. And I was young. I was about 12 then, 13. And, um, and then they were announcing it. And, uh, and they give it to me. And I remember, like even now, all these years later, I remember distinctly, one, how surprised I was. And two, I remember he gave a little speech before he said the name of who was getting it. And he said, this kid's the first one in and the last one out. Yeah, and I remember this feeling of like, oh, someone's seen me, someone's seen me, you know, like, and and that done something to me as a kid, and I and I think without doubt that's still why I prepare now, like I do for roles and stuff, like I was saying earlier. I still kind of had this, I'm going to work mentality, mm. and um, 
Yeah, going, that goes back to what you get, what you take from these clubs. Like it's funny how I can still remember that little speech he gave. It was only like a little thing, you know. But um, yeah, I think Steve Bunce was there when that got given out as well. I remember Steve being there and they give a little speech. Yeah, Steve funny. didn't win. Yeah, it. Steve came second. No. <laughs> <laughs> he still talks about it now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> should we? Uh, should we make a fight, George? Go on then. Come on then. Let's do it. Yeah. Right. So what we do in these these episodes as well, John, is we we try and make a fight with someone within your industry. Right. You against someone against of your someone. choosing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've already, we've already um, established that you didn't meet Tom Hardy, where, even though you've worked for him on, on, his, on yeah. his projects before, but you haven't met him yet, jiu-jitsu no. champion that he is. Yeah. We've already seen Floyd Mayweather beat, beat, beat Conor McGregor, so you'd beat Tom Hardy in a fight because it, boxing always beats MMA. Tom's got that look in the eye, though, hasn't he? Yeah. He's got that, you know, like some people have got that look where you think you ain't going to yeah, stop, no, are you? You're that. coming yeah. at me. And um, <laughs> I've never met, you know, I've never met Tom, mm. and yet he's produced two, pro he's basically given me two jobs, you know, a Christmas Carol. <laughs> he's paid your wages. And, uh, yeah, well, he's got his own production company, and so they made a Christmas Carol, and, um, and then they just made Great Expectations. So he's been my boss twice, you know, <laughs> and as exec producer, he would have had to have signed off on me, you know, but I've never got to meet him and shake his hand, you know, mm. and... Um, you are an avoided fighter, uh, Johnny, don't yeah. worry about <laughs> it. They're ducking him. They're ducking him. Ducking him. I can't fight Tom, he'll never give yeah. me work yeah. again. He's the only one who gives me any work, you so know. Who, so let's yeah. go through some of the people you, you've, you've worked alongside. Are there any other boxers? Um, oh, hold on, yeah, good question. Um, well, obviously, like Luke Smith, who played yeah, the so opponent. Yeah, so he boxed, he boxed a bit, yeah. Yeah, Luke, Luke was... Um, and obviously Ray had, what, 60 bouts or something? Yeah, for the yeah, 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 Ray, and he's got it, Ray, you know, he really, I've got some beautiful footage of him with all the kids in the gym, just kind of behind the scenes stuff, where he's warming up with them, and the kids are loving him, and and um, and he's got it, you know, he's, he, you know, he rolls the shoulders, and um, <laughs> uh, who have I ever worked with? I haven't, no, I'm trying to think of boxers who... Um, I'm going to be embarrassed now because when I leave the studio, I think, oh, of course, like, I've got him. good friends yeah. who, you know, um, but yeah, no, Stephen Graham, funny enough, who's not a boxer, oh. but um, in This Is England and, and uh, you know, spoiler alert, anyone who wants to watch it and hasn't, but Vicky kills me. Didn't yeah. Vicky? Another terrifying character in that. Yeah. In that whole and then thing. Stephen comes in after I'm dead and I'm on the floor and then he tries to obviously make it look like it's him who's done it. So I'm laying there dead, right? And they put a pad on me because Stephen has to come in and then he, he clumps me and stuff and um, he missed the pad <laughs> and like a true pro I'm trying to play dead you know and I'm holding it and um, but he done me three times in the ribs and um, <laughs> none of them hit the pad nah, he's got a dig yeah, he's making a big boxing project now Steve yeah. he's doing a big I don't know when it's going to be out because they're still filming it and stuff but it'll be good you can mm. guarantee it'll be good I think um, Ashley Waters is directing it and yeah. like, it's going to be good man it's going to be really so good he can punch his, his accuracy is not great yeah, right? he's, yeah, he's got a dig I never saw it because my eyes were closed <laughs> so I don't know what his oh, oh. technique's like but he, so um, you're supposed to be dead at that point yeah. and he's whacking you yeah. what you just got to stay dead <laughs> that must be us <laughs> just, <laughs> just, trying to kick me head in the carpet like you know <laughs> and um, yeah he's um, first yeah. one in last one out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's still there Johnny <laughs> still got it I think I think that's a good fight you and Stephen Graham yeah that's pay per view yeah Steve's yeah, he's um, yeah, no, Steve would have it. He, he, it's almost a rematch as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. of cheap shots on this is yeah. England. <laughs> where, where, where's the what's the ideal venue? Do you I'll tell you the toughest act I've ever worked with. Do you want to know the toughest act I've ever worked with? Vicky McClure. Oh, yeah, and I'll tell you, I'm not saying that to she's one of my dear, dear mates, Vicky, but that that big kind of finale scene that we shot where it gets really physical mm. with me and her, we shot that over four days and um. Four days. Four days. And because Shane shot in so many ways, like and there's stuff that you'll never see on camera, like, but he shot it with red gauze over the windows, so it looked like hell. And he was experimenting with all sorts of things. So we shot over four days. I broke my hand. There was one bit where I I, I punched the floor, right? Not not in the scene, like, but I, the energy was dipping and we were gone. And I tried, and I don't know why it was nonsense, but I, I whacked the floor and it was concrete. There was all wooden floorboards, and then there was this concrete joist. Of course, I found the joist. <laughs> and it came up like that. Like, they called it baby Shane because it looked like Shane's head. He drew a face on it. And then, um, and if you watch that scene um, of me attacking Vic and whatever, because it's like an amalgamation of different takes. And if you watch that scene, there's one bit where I go like that and you see my hand looks like a balloon and, um, <laughs> and it goes back in its normal size again. But um, yeah, so Vicky's, there's photos of her after that um, four days. There's a photo of her in a kind of bar and she's black and blue, man. And she never moaned once. She never, she really went there you know really went there and I've, I've worked with some kind of sort of tough guy you know yeah. people who you'd think oh he's got a bit about him and um, they don't come anywhere close to what Vic went through man she, mm. she was she's is that strong. awkward is that awkward before, do you have a discussion beforehand 
like yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, because, you know, there is like an health and safety element and whatever. And with that, it weren't like there was any punches thrown or anything, mm. but it, it was a, a, like a ragdoll effect. But I remember was what Shane was saying, this is, she's becomes a ragdoll in his arm, you know, and it's mm. visceral and it's all of that. So it was just like bruising all over, you know, and she bruised easy big, I remember. Um, you know, I remember being mortified when I saw the photo. It was just, you know, <sighs> yeah. Um, no, so Vix, um, I wouldn't want to, do eight rounds with Vic. No. Yeah. <laughs> she can ref you against Stephen. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> so you you already established we don't want you don't want to be boxing in London. You don't want to you don't want that one in London. You want to go to Liverpool for that. Oh, I don't know. Neutral. Yeah, he, he, the, the Scouts is a lawyer, weren't they? Man, yeah. that, that's a big hometown of ours. Go yeah. to Cardiff. You always do well yeah. in Cardiff. Yeah, Cardiff. Yeah, we like it. Yeah. 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 Barry on comms. Yeah. <laughs> Barry just, on comms. Just, who's who's in your corner, Johnny? So we've got Stephen Graham fighting in Cardiff. Um. It's got to be Shane, isn't it, in my corner? Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Got, to be the, it's got to be the man, Shane McGuigan. Um, he's a different league, Shane, as well. Like, you know, he's, um, he's no nonsense. And he's... Shane, Ray Winston on cuts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barry <laughs> Winston. Like, you just send in the picture. Uh, yeah. Keep your hands up. Yeah. Keep, I'm bleeding. Yeah, keep your hands up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was sitting on a mountain top. And see, Lee, he's got home in Sicily, Ray. He was sitting in um, Sicily peeling spuds. And <laughs> yeah. Keep your hands up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd watch it. What, what were you reckon? That's 12 rounds? You could do, yeah. I think maybe. Who are you bringing in for sparring for Stephen Graham? And do you know when you were sparring on the, on the jawbone prep, who were they getting for you? Oh, I, t I tell you. What sort of blokes were they getting? Oh, um... There was a guy called um, uh, Caesar coming. who was a white qualifier. He was the first um, lad who come in, and he turned out to be a right nice bloke. Like I think he'd done some TV work. Like um, I can't remember now. It's vague, but they brought him over, and he'd, he'd had a few um, white collar fights. And um, and if I'm honest, I needed it. I needed livening up because I was just a bit naive and stuff. And I sort of, you know. I built up to this thing and I went out and I remember he ran across the ring and smashed me with a like an aim maker like you know and it was it became quite evident he was there to take me out you know and um yes yeah, so I remember they brought him I tell you he was good man I tell you an actor I've just thought of Daniel Kaluuya oh really who won the Oscar Daniel Kaluuya is a really good friend really dear friend right he'd done a play called Sucker Punch um and yep. it was at the Royal Court Theatre and I went along just because it was a boxing play and he blew my mind and the shape that he got in for it and the uh you know, he was he was incredible, like really incredible. And that was kind of set in the British amateur sort of scene, you know. Um, I think maybe one of the McKenzie brothers trained him. Clinton, maybe Clinton McKenzie mm. or, uh, or Duke might have trained him. Mm. Um, but whoever trained him, he really looked like a real deal. Like he looked great. So he hadn't boxed before? He only boxed no, for that part? No, he hadn't oh, boxed right, before. Well, yeah. And I think, he, I think he again had to do a real transformation. I think he might have had a bit of weight on him and stuff. Like it was a proper job you know he really went you, you would have been able to spot that if it wasn't if it yeah. didn't look I, he was legit. incredible he was incredible from the opening thing and i knew he I, for some reason i knew he was a, a non-fighter i knew he was a, an actor and he'd never thought he'd never you know um and then from the opening thing he was skipping and stuff and you just kind of thought he's put the work in this fella mm. and and then when he was shadow boxing and stuff again you just thought he's really put the work in you know mm. um yeah um yeah you could have him though can you daniel kaluuya yeah no, he's nippy. He's, uh, he's nippy. He's like, see, again, I'm still too nice. Well, I ain't got that thing. Shane used to tell yeah. me off, like, when that fella come across and Jimmy and we went back and Shane went, you, you're too, what are you doing? Like, you're too not like, and then I think in the later rounds, I started to get, like, you know, I started to, went, you know, broke him down a bit and whatever, but I wouldn't finish him, you know, like, and Shane was going, what's the matter with, like, yeah, you know, Shane's got that killer instinct thing and I don't know, I'll never, that, that's kind of gone. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I've been a lovey for too long. I? What, what are you wearing? What's, what's, what's your ring? kit I can't <laughs> place it what, what are you thinking you're going very basic like Tyson sort of just there to do a job or are you going to go it's mad with it Barry McGregor late 80s yeah. era Blue do you know what was boots. funny was as a kid I really wanted to be Tyson and yeah I was like a skinny little white kid from you know like and I, but I remember you know around that time everyone would come to the gym in like black trainers and no boots. socks yeah, and, yeah. you know and um, and we were all skimp we didn't even really have boots you know but everyone would have like black shorts and, and we'd be walking around like with a scowl on you know as best a scowl as you could give and we'd be doing a little neck shake thing that he would do and all of that and you could just tell we'd all seen Tyson fight the night before and um yeah and then um so yeah I don't know yeah we'd probably go for the black trunks there was something about that weren't there mm. it was cool I'm not I, I couldn't do the uh, the razzmatazz I don't think I'd pull that off <laughs> I remember I, I never did as a kid either we had like our kit was black uh black shorts you know and the white vest with the two black stripes but mm. I remember when I fought Barry Jones and when I fought um uh 
Dazza Williams when I fought him. He was the first kid I ever fought who had tassels on and stuff. <laughs> I remember being a bit spun out by it. Like, That's you know? the point, isn't it? Yeah, and he, looked, like, yeah. and he did look the part. He looked great. And I was a bit gutted, you know, because I love Sugar Ray and stuff. <laughs> but I never had it in me to wear the tassel. I just didn't have the bottle. I think I might even have bought some. And someone down the lodge would have given it to me for it. And I was like, <laughs> like, get them off, you know. <laughs> and that was the end of my tassels, yeah. So like, it'd be probably standard kit, I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Wicked. Uh, we we yeah, we need a tune. Yeah, so Johnny, we got a, we ask everyone uh, to give us their ring walk track. Um, to add to our playlist that's on Spotify so we've got a list of everyone's tracks now so we know who you're fighting where you're fighting what you're wearing tassels are left at the wayside but what's your ring walk track can't really like so well wrote a beautiful song for anyone who's not heard it it's called The Ballad of Jimmy McCabe that's the theme song for the film and the character I play is Jimmy McCabe like in the film and he wrote this song called The Ballad of Jimmy McCabe but it is a ballad and I've done home man it, like it might put me a opponent to sleep before yeah. I get it, like, you know but it's a bit soft I don't know man it wouldn't be what, what song you could do the first few bars of that and then crack it into something a bit more something upbeat. a bit more up what's, you what's could even get, playlist you could even get Paul Weller on doing playing the first yeah there's a couple of good, stage. there's a couple of good Weller tunes I'll train to um, what, what do I train to there's a good Richard Ashcroft that's the number one I'm going through my playlist and my training like, when <laughs> which, I get which Richard gym. Ashcroft tune uh, there's a Verve tune called Love Is Noise oh yeah that's a, that's a, that's that a gets great, me yeah, yeah I'm alright if I'm getting on the treadmill Bit of love is noise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll crank the speed up a bit to that. <laughs> yeah, we'll stick that on. That's, yeah, good. that's not on there. We get that on. No, we, love is we noise. Could, what, we should, you could you could walk out. You know, Paul Weller there playing the first bit, and then Richard Ashcroft. In yeah. fact, get the whole verve just playing. Yeah, playing reunion. the second bit. I yeah. mean, this is a dream. You do what you want. Yeah, yeah. And then you're going to win, obviously. Yeah. I reckon you want to win in sort of attritional fashion, though, don't you? You, you should do the ring walk you... like Bittersweet Symphony yeah. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> just keep walking into people. Just keep walking through people. Pump it like the video. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. By attrition, you, you really want to yeah, earn wanna... it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, again, I used to love McGuigan. I, I loved him and I loved those fights, you know, where he'd wear him down, wear him yeah. down. And then, you know, the sort of late stop his body shots. And I did love all that. Like, you think you'd love a quick knockout, wouldn't you? But um, there was something about that. There was something about the. Um, the breaking down of someone again I don't know whether that's kind of some metaphor for playing God or something I don't know mm. but it was something about seeing that evolve and kind of having a trust in it almost as well of trusting that in the later rounds you were going to come through you know and that feeling of relief I suppose if you yeah. in fact it's a question for you George do you when you look back at the wins I suppose every win is different but like when you just iced someone you must have felt like the man but equally like how, how did that feeling compare to when you had to wear someone down or maybe you got off the floor or you won on points yeah is it the same feeling in the moment or is there a different feeling how do they compare and what did you prefer yeah i mean if you if you ice someone there is that there's that joy like there's <laughs> that that uh, it's it's not nice it's that cruelty yeah you know that you know that that mm. surge um of like yes well, it's so fulfilling it's like i don't know hitting a hole in one or something you know but yeah. um if you had had to suffer for it and then you win that's a nicer feeling that's a better feeling it's mixed in with like joy and relief sometimes probably feels a little bit more like relief at the time but ultimately as time goes on um that's the one that stays with you longer you yeah. know mm. i think spiritually as well you know like because any you know like you said there's something spiritually elating in even even in a quick sort of finish or the, the, the clinical finish but overcoming adversity I guess that's what a boxing's a metaphor for anyway and so if there's a part in a fight where you genuinely think you're gone or you're looking in the opponent's eye and you're thinking he's got me here I'm <laughs> gone I don't think I've got it I, I'm done and then you overcome that that's kind of powerful that's I think there's something in that that's that's Big, I think, mm. you know? Yeah, no, it's like getting chin. Like, what's your? Um, yeah, I mean that? That, that too. It's um, it's like it's mixed. It's mixed in again. It's not like a you, you got shame. You got that feeling of like embarrassment, and shame, as well as like disappointment, sadness. Um, and then I'm not sure what's the most overpowering. Like what what one stays at the top, and you just because so much has gone into it and then for so long you're sort of tunnel vision and it's just i'm only thinking about myself what have i done what have i done with that and then when you if you lose and you get knocked out you sort of all, all of a sudden it's 
maybe part of like sharing the burden, but then you also start thinking, oh, I've let everyone down, I've let everyone down. Um, I've blown it, I've taught this wrong, got that wrong. And then, because ultimately you feel like the buck stops with you. So mm. that's kind of what happens after you get you get knocked out. Mm. I had it once, like on a low level, on an amateur junior level. I had it, um, I fought a guy called Marlon Thompson, who was from around here. I think he was from Walthamstow, and he was good. He was he was better than me at the time. I think he'd fought for Young England, and it was the NABC London Finals. And I think they nearly pulled me out, but the, we they we we'd done it. And I only had I think I'd had three fights up till then. Um, so we knew it was a tall order sort of thing. But he was, I remember, he was like hands low. He had power even then, even at that age and stuff. He he was stopping people knocking them out and um and it was at the um the grosvenor house and i remember coming out for it and i remember seeing him and you know and he looked apart as well i remember he had like a glitzy sort of um uh robe and stuff you know like a jacket as a robe and and um and i remember coming out and i remember going to the center of the ring and i remember doing that and then the, the story goes that we we came out in round one went across the middle of the ring and then he chinned me with a left hook and i went down and a lot of the time, in uh, that age, in those it's things, all, it's all over. The mm. ref looks in your eyes. It's that's it. It's a, a job done. But um, but I got up and I showed the ref my hands. I'm all right. And um, and then we carried on and had this like proper little humding up, like a right. And I got caught in the third. We had a clash of heads, and I got a cut eye, and it got stopped right at the end of the third round. But I remember Mickey Duff coming over, and people like I remember. Remember, it's funny what you remember. He had a cigar, and I remember his cigar smoke. <laughs> and he looked at him when I've seen worse, kid. And like, I remember people were buzzing about the fight. And the truth of it is, I don't remember any of it yeah. from the moment I got chinned. Yeah. Until, like, I think, like, standing in the corner at the end of the third round and being told it's being stopped. And I've got vague memories of that then, of just going, what? Like, and again, it's all right, the cut eye, it's, it's, it's over. And, um, yeah, and then I spent the night in St. Thomas's Hospital. <laughs> but the truth is, I don't remember anything from... When I got hit on the chin, yeah, not a thing. That's mm. weird, isn't it? That's mm. like odd, yeah, odd feeling. It's, it's concussion for you. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, let's talk about what you're currently doing at the moment. New projects, what you're working on, but we yeah. already know the answer to this. We do because we spoke off air. So yeah. what's what's the crack at the moment? What are you up to? So the ones that are on the telly, there's um there's two really that have been out for a few months now. There's a, a show called Without Sim, which I did with Vicky. It's yeah. the first time we've worked together since um This Is England. So that's like a four part drama. What, what was that like being back? Back together after what, what that, that must have been years, years yeah. and years working. Like. Yeah, first for over 10 years. And um, and she's, Vic's one of my closest friends on the planet. You know, like it's a really, really deep friendship. Um, to be honest, the shoot was a bit weird because we shot it in lockdown. So mm. it was all set up to be this incredible experience. Me and my best mate in our hometown of Nottingham. It was just like, you know, the perfect conditions. We never saw each other because it was in lockdown. Mm. And because we were both lead actors, we had to really adhere to the rules, you know, because if... Either of us would have got COVID, the whole project would have, you know. So we never saw each other really, but the show went down really well, you know, like so it was lovely. Like the people really dug it and um that's that's been a lovely response to that show. Vicky got a BAFTA nomination for it. It was like that was great. Really, really um that was good stuff. And then we did um Great Expectations, the thing that Tom produced and um played Magwitch in that. So that's out now as well on um Disney Plus, I think, and, and those channels. And then um and and then I'm I'm in the middle of filming something now, and um, we were quite close to the end of filming, and then the strikes have kicked in. But it's um it's called A Gentleman in Moscow. So it's a big best selling novel um, in America. A few sort of eminent people, I think I think was it Barack Obama and Bill Gates, and a few people said this is their favourite novel. So it sold millions over there. They were turning it into um into a big TV show, Showtime. Um, they're turning it into um into an eight part series, and um yeah, Ewan McGregor's the lead. And um, so we're in the middle of that, really, or beyond the middle of it, and hopefully we'll be going back and finishing it real soon. soon as showtime in the, in the US. Showtime in the US, and it'll be Paramount UK. We've still got a few scenes to do. I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah. roll a shoulder again. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's no, about it for me it. now. It that's my, it. my boxing now is literally, I'll stand in front brushing my teeth, you know, and you look and you do that, then you go, yeah, I've still got still it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I ain't. <laughs> so we're not going to wait another seven years for Jawbone 2, but yeah. is there plans for it? We're going to get it? But do you know what? I'm writing now, and uh, it, it won't be a Jawbone 2, I don't think. Although it's funny like a few people have mentioned that I don't think I've got any interest in writing about Jimmy again but there's a couple of other characters in it I'd be interested to see what happens to them yeah um, so who knows like maybe I'll do a Shane Meadows you know like and come back to it after 10 years or something you know Jimmy's the trainer by that point yeah I'll, I'll, I often wondered that you know like because the film ends on um on a kind of almost a question you know and hopefully there's enough within that question that you get some kind of hope or a sense of hope but you don't really know 
it could, it could um, from that moment, it could go either way, you know? And so it'd be interesting to see. But I like the idea of um, of him going full circle. When we're, the, the, the film's about someone who's deeply, deeply, deeply self-centred, as all addicts are, um, coming to a realisation that life's about what you give and not what you take. And I think he realises that those men that he thought were once holding him back almost, you know, were holding him up. And it's very humbling. And I, I think, um, you know, so having had that awakening, I love the idea that he then becomes part of the kind of solution in that club, you know, part of the positivity of life, you know, rather than someone who just takes from everyone all the time. Yeah. Where can people watch Jawbone? So it's still, I should know all this, shouldn't I? Yeah, I was going to say, putting I, you on the, the spot The only one it's yeah. not on is Netflix. Okay. For legal reasons. It's going to go back on Netflix, but I'm not sure when it's got, it, like there's a contractual thing because the BBC made it. It's BBC Films. So I think it's on, um, it's on um, Amazon Prime. It's on Disney Plus, on Apple. It's on all of them, I think, except Netflix pretty much. Yeah. Okay, nice. We don't care. Netflix don't sponsor us. No, so. well, if, they do, if you want to, though. Yeah. If they do, yeah. <laughs> We're on YouTube now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did want to ask as well, before we let you go, aspiring actors might be listening and they might, maybe young boxers as well, and maybe they're in that Venn diagram that you found yourself in where boxing and acting were, were both fascinating to you. Where, what what's the, what do you do? What's, what's the advice for someone who's thinking, I think I could do that or that I want to explore more of that? Yeah. What's the, what's the route? For me... Um, and again, it'll be different for different people. Look, the truth of it is, right, I was skint back then, you know, like, like I say, my mum raised me on her own and, you know, so it wasn't like there was a windfall of money to fall on or, or to subsidise training of some kind. And, but I was lucky in that there was a local college, um, further education college called Morley College in Lambeth, right two minutes away from the Fitzroy Lodge. Um, and um, they did acting classes in there. You can learn anything in there. You can learn language, chess, flower arranging, you know. They teach everything, but um, they, they had a, and luckily the acting teacher in there just, I just connected, you know, he was a good man, still is a great man. And, um, and so I did that. I went to a local cheap acting class and I would say to anyone, like, do that, find your local place. Like, there's no reason for you not to try. That's, the, if there's any advice to give, <coughs> there's Jeez. no reason for you not to try. If you're thinking that maybe money's going to be an obstacle to it or anything like that, it's simply not true. Like there will be a place local to you where you can go and explore it at least. And I mean that on an artistic level and on a cathartic level, you know, just for something to do on a Wednesday night. If you want to go and explore it, give it a try. Or if you're a young kid who's thinking about boxing, go to your local club, give it a try. You know, if you don't want to make money at it, like, that's a whole different question and another conversation, you know. But, um, and that's difficult and, you know, um, all sorts of obstacles you'll have to overcome to do that. But to, to go and explore it as a way of expressing yourself in some ways, there will be somewhere local to you that you can go and do that. Like further education colleges, are, I'd recommend. Mm. That's what me and you were going after, yeah. after this. Yeah. We're going to try kick write the theme tune. Mine. George, last one, please. Last bit of housekeeping. Yeah, okay. Let's go top three. Yeah. Mm. Right, top three, Johnny. So, massive boxing fan. You, you get up at godly hours to watch the boxing. Is there any big fights that you want to see happen now on the world stage? Um, I, 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 you know, I've got an affinity with a McGuigan team, you know, so any of their fights, like, you know, Azim who's coming through now, like, you know, if he's fighting, I, I want to see that journey. The one person I've not mentioned was Josh Taylor. Uh, Josh joined the club just as I was starting as well. So I saw his journey from literally joining the McGuigans to become an undisputed, you know, champion. That was incredible. Incredible. Um, so yeah, Josh, I've, and, and I'm friends with Josh, you know, we've stayed in touch and uh, got a lot of love for him as well. Um, of the fighters now, big fights I'd love to see. It's, it's the big ones, you know, at the risk of, you know, going the obvious route, but yeah, do it. Well, we we had Spence Crawford. Everyone said that, but it's, we've had that now, yeah. so we can tick that off. Yeah. But what for you are the the, the low hanging fruit, the big ones that we have to see? I can't help but like you know, like I love uh, whether it should even be done. I don't know, but the the idea of Canelo and Crawford, you can't help just think like, can that happen? I yeah. don't know what you think, Jules. Like, what do you? I don't know either. No, I'm sort of if it gets made, I'll think about it. Sort of thing. I'm not sure. Yeah. I was, I was big on. I fancy Charlo against Canelo and I look egg on my face because he was just too small. Yeah. And Crawford's even smaller. Yeah. And he's not even a big welterweight. He's established at the weight, but he's really a, he's really 10 stone and he's come up. So then going up again, I just think he'd be too small. Yeah. I think if they were the same size, he wins a fight, clearly. Yeah. But yeah. 
He's too small, surely. Canelo mm. Benavidez. That's the fight, yeah. Big one. Um, yeah. Canelo, man, he's one I'll stay up for. Really, I don't yeah. care who he's fighting, even. I just think he's a consummate. I, I, I just find him incredible to watch. Um, um, Tank Shakur. Yeah. You know, that's interesting. Who would you pick to win? I, yeah, you know what? Like, it's hard to go against Tank, isn't it? Because, mm. you know, just the explosive nature and the, and the ring craft and everything. But Shakur, he's, he's so... If anyone's going to achieve that, it'll be him. You know, like that that ring craftsmanship is pretty incredible like you know and it's funny because i used to hate um you know this modern era of sort of sparring footage being leaked you know i was like one of those i was kind of like no nah, that's not on i don't like that <laughs> especially people getting you know sparked in sparring and that because you're like well you know it's behind closed doors and it's the place to learn and you know it's a bit like i don't want people filming my rehearsals you know god forbid <laughs> some of the stuff you see in those man it's not pretty but um i um but I, I will I will go online to watch like Shakur or someone sparring even mm. you know because it's just it's incredible levels you know um, is that three that's two two who would you have in the heavyweight batch which heavyweights do you want to, would you like to put together you um, can be as obvious as you want um, I, I'm 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 I'm, a, I'm loving Usyk I just think what he's done is so special. Uh, I think you know he, he's with you really George would yeah. you pick him to beat Fury Johnny. Oh, difficult, difficult. Mm. Tyson, man, he's too again, big. yeah, big, but with what he does with it as well, you know, again, just an incredible specimen, you know. Again, I've never really seen the likes of it before, mm. you know, like to be that size and that, just all of it, you know, like how do you, how do you beat that, you know? If, if, again, if anyone could, I just, I love the purity of it and I love that. That's why, you know, with a Shakur or with a Usyk, you know, you'd just always be intrigued with that level of ring craftsmanship. Could it be done? Like, could it be done? It's like, you know, Capontia versus Dempsey or something. Like, could it be done? You know, like, can it be done? And and those fights are always intriguing. Like, mm. I love that. I love, um, I think we're in a period at the moment that's like really special. I do. I think it's pretty special at the minute. I'm, I'm like, yeah. Mm. I'm staying up later than I ever have. <laughs> Sunday's a write off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you think you fancy you sick in the Fury fight, don't you? I think so, yeah. Mm. Really, George, yeah. I think so. I think he's, yeah. I think he's great. I just think yeah. he's, he's brilliant. I think he's impossible to beat right now. But Shane said it way back in the day. I remember that being in the gym way back then. And I think I might have said to Shane, is there any, who, who would you train of anyone if you could train anyone? And, um, and it was the first time I'd ever seen Usyk, actually. He mm. got him up on the thing. And I remember that he had that nutty haircut. Yeah. And I was like, who's this fella? <laughs> and to see what he's gone on and done, it's like, it's incredible. But Shane called it really early. Yeah. He said, this fella's on another level. He said, um, yeah. Yeah. And um, I still want to see AJ Fury as well. Do you? you? Like, yeah. That, that, Who would you pick? Fury, I think. Mm. Yeah, Fury. And again, though, you know, it's, it's, it's heavyweight boxing. AJ brings so much to the table, all of that, you know. But um, I, I think Fury's just... There's something incredible there as well. It's quite unique, really. Mm. Uh, yeah, unique fighter. Just a mm. unique human being, really. Again. Definitely. That's yeah. three good fights. That's we'll three put, we'll great put them on the fights. board. Yeah, Hopefully we it. get them. We normally yeah. get what we ask for in here. Well, that was amazing. That was brilliant. I'm, I'm off to oh. I think watch the entire Johnny Harris back catalogue now. I feel inspired <laughs> to do so. Go and relive, relive some of the moments. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Do you know now from that. To be, oh, what's that? What's the film that went five years under the radar? Oh, oh, London, London to Brighton. To Brighton. Yeah. I, yeah. Saw that. I saw that when I was at uni. What year did that come out? It came out in 2006 because this yeah. season was 2010, yeah. so it was four years. Yeah, yeah. I watched it at uni. I'm, what, I'm five years it. between it being made, yeah. But it was made for um, 60 grand, that film. What? Yeah, and it got a BAFTA nomination. So it, it kind of, but the problem was with it was because um, like, we couldn't have got better reviews. But but they all thought we were unknown. They thought we were untrained actors. Yeah. I think they just thought that Paul Andrew Williams, the director, had found a couple of people from the building site, so you know, and so I was gutted. At the time. I was fuming yeah. at the time. I remember a couple of reviews were going. He's got these great, you know, untrained actors. It's like what? I've been two years, yeah, gutted. And so I just, this, next thing I'm back on the building site. I think what's happened here? Like you yeah. know, um, yeah. No, That's how much it costs yeah. London to Brighton now on the Great West trains. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> because Lorraine Stanley is, um, you know, she uh, in EastEnders and yeah. stuff. Brilliant actress and little Georgia Groom and. Sam Sproul, like, it was really, yeah, cool little team on that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. well, that's George Rose Boxing Club, Film Club is now officially open. Yes, it is. Starts yeah. with London to Brighton, it goes on to Jawbone, and we might as well do the whole of This Is England film in the series. <laughs> Lovely. Amazing. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie, so oh, much. Hey, great to have you on. Nice one.